Good morning. It is good to have you with us in worship today. I am the Reverend Lynn Spencer Smith, pastor and teacher of First Congregational United Church of Christ in Great Falls, Montana. We are an open and affirming congregation celebrating that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. I welcome you into our sanctuary. This is our sacred space that is waiting for us. But right now we are um, keeping our building closed as a way to protect one another and our community. Today is a communion Sunday. So later on in the service, we will be celebrating communion together, even though we are scattered. I invite you to bring to your worship experience with you some bread and an appropriate beverage for communion, and then you will be guided through the, the communion service in time. Welcome to worship. Good morning and welcome to worship. Deep inside all of us, old and young alike, there is a place of faith, a place of trust and hope and love. In this place that unites us in our diversity, it is this place that connects us, not only to one another, but to one God. It is this place of faith that is within all of us that calls us together for worship. May we enter into this time from that place not the place of fear, not the place of anger, not the place of competition or apathy. Come to worship from your place of faith. Let us pray. O oh God, whose, worthy fills, whose glory fills the earth, whose presence is all around us, if we only have the will to see and to hear, meet us here today. Meet us in word and in silence. Meet us in song and wonder. Meet us in our questions and our certainty. Meet us with your love. Amen. Thank you. 
Today's reading is scripture reading, Luke 7, chapter and verses 1 through 17. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus' famous sermon contained the Beatitudes and other favorites about light of the world. Salt of the earth is given on a hillside and is often referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is recorded to give that sermon on a level place. It's Luke's way of Jesus living out what his mother Mary proclaimed in the Magnificat, and that was brought forth from the prophet Isaiah. The low will be lifted up, and the mighty will be brought low. Valleys will be filled, and mountain and hill will be made low. When Jesus gave the sermon on a level place, it was his way of getting the message across that what had been proclaimed about him was being fulfilled. The reading that we have today comes after Jesus had delivered his famous sermon. He went forth to live into what had been proclaimed about him and what he had just preached. Let us listen to a story of the healing of two sons from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them. But when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to you to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I am also a man set under authority with soldiers under me and say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was as amazed at him and turned to the crowd that followed him and said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples in a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate to the crowd, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said, Do not weep. When he came forward and touched the Buyer, and the bearers stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. Good morning, church. I'm so glad that you are joining us for worship today. I invite you to be with me in the spirit of prayer. Gracious and loving one, we are so grateful that you bring us together, even though we are separated. You bring us together in your spirit 
as a worshiping community. I pray, O oh God, that with these words, your heart will be opened up to us, and with the meditations of our hearts, we will be connected with you ever more deeply. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So, does anybody notice anything different about me lately? Anything? Anything at all? Well, here's the deal. Since we have moved our services to virtual, everything pretty much is recorded. And since I've become the final editor of the service, and since we've started broadcasting on, on television, and since anything that we do together as a church involves a screen, I've ended up looking at my face a whole lot more than I used to. And I've started to notice that there's a few things that stand out a little bit more, especially with the artificial light. And then they really show up if, if I'm watching myself on like a big screen television. And since so much of church and public life these days is focusing on faces, because that's about all we see of one another is like from here on up. Um, I have to confess, I drank the beauty industry's Kool-Aid and bought some makeup so that I could literally put my best face forward. Um, now you all have to know that I have not worn makeup really since our wedding. And that's been about 27 years ago. So, you know, I've just done a little cheat coloring and to let, kind of smooth out some of the blemishes and some concealer here and there to hide some of the dark spots under my eyes and this, this funky little thing that's on the corner of my mouth and, and some lipstick and some mascara. So it's nothing fabulous. It's nothing over the top. But y'all also have to know that mascara for me falls into that category sometimes of why bother? Because I seem to have inherited my dad's eyelashes that, that tend to be short and they grow straight down. Um, and then I've got this situation where gravity is taking hold of my eyelids and, and they're kind of uh, drooping a little bit more and more and more. In fact, there are times that it feels like my eyelids are resting on top of my eyelashes. So, you know, you know, here's a here's an image of the kind of eyelashes that supposedly we're we're all supposed to have, and and supposedly all it takes is to put this mascara on them, and and then those lashes will explode with curl and and volume. But I have to tell you that just because I coat these um, straight pointy down eyelashes in some black goo goo gooey stuff. Um, there's no exploding going on with my eyelashes. So by the way, um, this particular ad was brought under scrutiny because it turns out that this model who has lovely eyes um, has lash extensions. Lash extensions, really, they exist? Somewhere, there's a line that separates what my best face actually is and what the industry suggests that my best face should be. Y'all have to know that there will not be any lash extensions in my future. I, I kind of like the short, straight, pointing down lashes that my dad gave me. Besides that, I am just too frugal with my money and too stingy with my time to even think about what it takes to do lash extensions. It's the same reason that I stopped coloring my hair years ago. That and I just really kind of decided that God does this, all of this better than I can. So I'm just gonna kind of let, for the most part, God do with this what needs to happen. But then I got wondering, what is our best face? What is our best face as a community, as individuals, as a church? 
Is it about implanting something that is not real on top of what we've inherited so that we'll fit some marketing standard? And then you have to realize and ask the question, just what is it that we have inherited? So let's go back to the reading that we just heard from Kim K. It comes at the first part of chapter 7 in Luke, and it begins with noting that Jesus has just made a bunch of sayings. Hmm. What sayings? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Heard that before? Then there's some stuff about turning the other cheek and giving your shirt um, after somebody takes your coat. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. And then the list of sayings, the sermon, ends with stuff about a person who built a house on a rock, and one who built a house without a foundation. So after these sayings, Jesus heads off to Capernaum with his newly called disciples, and he ends up performing a couple of miracles. He brings the slave of a Roman back from the brink of death, and he brings the son of a widow back from actual death. And you can kind of look at these two stories as kind of a test. A test to see if we were really listening to that sermon. So let's go back and look at the specifics about the people that are involved in these two stories. So the guy who was at death's doorstep was the slave of a centurion. The centurion was an officer in the Roman army, one that had apparently one over the folks of the Jewish community. He was a good guy. He had built their synagogue, and he was humble. He understood authority and how it could be used for good. Yet, he was still a Roman. But this story really wasn't about him. It was about his slave, a valued slave, a person who was near death will come to realize that the Roman wasn't the only person who valued this guy because Jesus apparently did as well and restored his health, restored his life. Then, then there are the others. The, the other person was the son of a widow, and he was, he was actually dead dead enough that the funeral was already underway. As his widowed mother's only son, he would have been her remaining source of livelihood and care. So by resurrecting the woman's son, Jesus restores not just the son's life, but the woman's life as well. But ultimately, it wasn't about the no longer dead son or his widowed mother. It was about Jesus. It was about Jesus and the face that he inherited and how he put that best face forward. That best face that he had inherited was the face of compassion. Both of these acts the restoring of the centurion's slave's life and the resurrecting of the widow's son are acts of compassion. And by performing these acts, Jesus is living out the sermon that he just preached. Loving enemies, not judging, doing to others what he would want to be done for him. He was acting on his own words. And that action connected to those words becomes the foundation of discipleship. It becomes the foundation of the church. 
So much of a life of discipleship and faith is the coming together of words and actions. When we embrace the faith of Jesus of Nazareth, Christianity, it's not just about saying the right words, which actually is doctrine. It's even more so about putting on the right face. The face, the actions, the behavior that all comes together and it becomes Christ's best face that is being put forward. Everywhere, with everyone, enemy, friend, neighbor, stranger. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to have a conversation with one of our seminary classmates. I think we were at a class reunion or general synod or something like that. And, and um, it, was, it was a number of years after we had been in active ministry for a while. And Louis was, was this guy's name. Instead of uh, doing local church ministry, he had become a Navy chaplain. So he was sharing some of his experiences of serving this diverse community. Different faith backgrounds, different ethnicities, different family experiences, even different levels of authority. And my friend went on to comment that um, the issues that he dealt with as chaplain, health issues, grief, fear, anxiety, joy, all of our deepest emotions, all of our basic needs, they don't recognize all those differences. And neither does compassion. It's what putting on our best face and putting that forward is about. So, so go back and think about our tradition's creation story, one of them, the, the, the part of the story where it talks about the creator that snatches up a handful of, of clay from the earth and shapes it into humanity and then, and then blows the holy breath into it. That is when our best face is instilled deep within us. And it's a face of compassion it's an image of love. It's a face of mercy. It's an image that reflects in the teachings of Christ through action. Action that extends the same compassion that Jesus showed the Roman, the widow, the slave, the son, you, me, our friends, and enemies alike. Action that reaches beyond class and race, reaches beyond religion and gender and sexual orientation and gender identity, and does so without judgment. Compassion is not a limited commodity. It is unending. Jesus recognizes that status does not define the need for compassion. The fact that compassion is instilled within him, within us, it's part of our spiritual DNA. It's part of who we are as people of faith. And it's what defines who we are and how we are. Compassion is not something that is supposed to be kept. Compassion is bestowed upon us so that we can give it. Sometimes that compassion brings what was dead back to life. Sometimes it wraps the grieving in a blanket of comfort. Sometimes it heals the body. Sometimes it heals the soul. Sometimes compassion feeds the hungry with literal food. Sometimes it changes systems so that hunger doesn't exist. But always, always, Compassion is the best face that we could ever put forward. It is what exists deep within our spiritual DNA. And for that, we can give thanks to God. Amen.
I invite you to be with me in the spirit of prayer. Always loving God, we hear of stories of your unbiased mercy from long ago and rejoice that the extension of your love continues even into our midst. We experience healing and reconciliation and give thanks. We know hope and simple acts of kindness and sing your praises. Even in times of struggle and death, your mercy finds a way to seep in and bring comfort and assurance. Entrust that your mercy is never ending. We lift up to you the needs of the world. We walk in a land that continues to be deeply divided. Grant us the mercy to focus on your call to justice and peace and recognize that to live in those conditions requires the compassion and understanding of everyone. We confess the ways we have contributed to divisions and seek the grace to change our ways and move forward. We share this earth with a virus that brings illness and death, causes economies to falter and political systems to become vulnerable Grant us the mercy to seek the wisdom of science combined with the hope of faith. Open us to hear and heed precautions and patience. Give us the courage to set aside personal desires for the well-being of all. We dwell upon a land that is the ancestral home of others, we recognize the devastation that has been done to entire cultures through unjust and unkind practices. Grant us the humility to peer into the errors of the past and work towards reconciling not just the people, but the land itself. We embrace a culture that has been built upon the backs and labors of others. We recognize the pain and trauma that extends through generations in attitudes and prejudices and judgment. Grant us the assurance of renewal as we move out of our vanity 
and work to recognize the generations of pain that is behind affluence. We live day to day in the presence of family and friends and neighbors who hunger, who seek release from disease and addiction, who seek freedom from abuse. We pray, O oh God, that as you open your heart to extend your mercy, you would open not just our hearts, but our very hands to be the expressions of that mercy. We pray for those who work tirelessly to care for others, to educate, to counsel, to provide safety and offer shelter. We pray for those who clean and mend and cook and serve. We pray for those who lead and those who are faced with making the hard decisions. May your wisdom and grace and goodness be a gushing shower upon them. We pray for ourselves and our church, O oh God, that in ways large and small, we somehow extend that unbiased mercy that has been shown to us in the one we know as Christ. Hear us as we pray the prayer of our Savior together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What is it that we can offer in response to God's good and gracious presence? God has made it very clear that God is not in search of empty offerings of worship and praise. Instead, God seeks the authentic gifts of compassion, kindness, and justice. As we consider the gifts that we have been given and will give, let us include our prayers and commitment that they be used in the ways of God. We are grateful for all of the genera generosity that has enabled us to keep our ministries going, even during a time of building closure. If you would like to contribute to the ongoing ministries of our church, you can send a donation to First Congregational United Church of Christ, Post Office Box 6303, Great Falls, Montana, 59406. Or you can go to our website, www.greatfallsucc.org, and use the Give Online feature. Let us use these moments to consider our gifts and ask God to use them abundantly.
I invite you to be with me in the spirit of prayer. O Holy One, could it be that the meager gifts we offer could become that which brings your great love to someone in need? Could it be that our clumsy hands could be that which bring comfort to a grieving soul? Could it be that these humble lives could be that which brings justice to the oppressed? Only with your blessings, dear God. So bless the gifts we offer, bless the work of our hands, and bless the passion of our souls to bring your love, your compassion, and your justice to the world. Amen. Friends, we come before the table of Christ. It is not me or the church that invites you here. This is Christ's table, and it is open to all. We recall the invitation extended to all who are weary to come into the grace and rest of Christ. So come, be loved, be fed, be nurtured at the table of Christ. I invite you to be with me in the spirit of prayer. Compassionate God, as we gather at a variety of tables, we place before us breads of all kinds, crackers and cereals, white bread, wheat bread, raised and flat. The variety of breads duplicate the varieties of people gathered in spirit at your table of grace and you invite us all. There are none that are more or less worthy to be at this table. There are none that are more or less worthy to receive your love. There are none that are more or less worthy to be fed. We are all loved, we are all valued, and we are all offered the nurturance of your grace. Jesus, whom we call Christ, has revealed to us that love. And so we gather in his name and in his risen spirit, remembering how he brought together his friends and those who followed in his ways first. We remember how he took the bread, the sustenance of the earth, and he asked for your blessing. And then he broke the bread and he shared it with all who were there, every single person. Looking at all who were gathered, he proclaimed, This is my body. Take and eat and remember me. And they did. After supper, he took the cup and lifting it to you for your blessing, he looked at all who were gathered and proclaimed, This is the cup of the new covenant sealed with my blood. Take and drink and be part of God's new relationship. And they did. And so we do as they did, remembering Christ as we take bread, ask for your blessing upon it, break it, and share it. And we receive the sustenance of both earth and heaven. We take the cup. And we ask for your blessing upon it. And then we drink in its goodness. And receive the gift of the new covenant created in Christ. Gracious God, we give you thanks that you have prepared a table of grace and made room for all. Continue to shape us into the reflection of the depths of your compassion. Move us from worship to service, from praise to action. Unite us in spirit as we look forward to the day when we are united once again in body. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
My friends, as you leave this time of worship, go into this day, into life, renewed, refreshed, nurtured, challenged, comforted, and held in the love of God. Remember that such gifts are given without judgment, without expectation, because that's just how God is. And so may the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Go in peace. Thank you.